that I'm working on at the moment, and it's like independence referendum viable aid. One of them is not actually about the independence referendum, just it, it made my head do stuff. Um, so anyway, here we go. <clears throat> He's on a train going north of the fence. There's a rusting rail that runs alongside the track as they go over the long, dry river bend. The graffiti on the rail says eyes, eyes, eyes. Maybe it was a warning once, but not anymore. The station is full of white-headed elderly people with bent backs and pastel coats, no colours in sight. When you get past about 60, he figures, you stop giving a shit what people think of you. Some of the old women have that look, that stare that says they dare anybody to ask them when their allegiance falls. The graffiti has changed since the fence went up. Live free or fry dying. He's been on the train since before the sun came up, and it's getting about time to switch his colours over. It's not like people don't do this on train journeys. He sees person after person slipping into the toilets and coming out in a different colour, but he doesn't want to be caught doing it. Nobody does. Eyes, eyes, eyes after all. He stands up and grabs his satchel, dutifully pressing his thumb to the reader before he ducks into the toilet cubicle and the door swishes shut Star Trek style behind him. There's not a lot of room to manoeuvre in here, but there's just enough. He sets his satchel on the sink and pulls out his second set of colours, purple and white. He replaces the badge on his jacket, the caps on his boots, and the cuff of, on top of his right ear. The blue and red go into the zippered compartment in his bag, hidden when he steps back out of the cubicle, a different man. It's not illegal to have a second set of colours on your person, as long as you aren't wearing them, but it's not something that he wants to advertise. They take it a lot more seriously in the north, and it's been getting worse in the south since the fence went up. He doesn't want to lose his job just because some eyeballs enough of a job's worth to try and turn him in for something he hasn't done. They are stopped on the bridge heading into Lupton. The security sweep of the train only takes a few minutes, and he takes the opportunity to check that he's got everything he needs. The only thing he's missing is his taser, but that will stay in the locker at the front of the compartment until they cross the border. It's illegal to carry in the south, but mandatory in the north, swings and roundabouts. The fog is thicker up here. In the south, it's more like a mist, practically invisible unless it's below zero cold. But the further north you go, the denser the fog becomes and the harder it is to see more than a few hundred meters in front of your face. The people in charge say it's not dangerous, something to do with the way that the climate is altering, but it's not exactly convenient. He thinks it's probably one of the reasons that they wear white in the north, because it's the easiest thing to see coming at you through the fog. The white on his boots keeps catching his eye as he glances around the carriage. It doesn't help that it's already pre-noon dark outside and the buzzy halogen lights inside the train make white pop while everything else gets washed out. He keeps accidentally focusing on his reflection in the window and has to fuzz his eyes out to make it stop. He's not doing this today. The buildings in Luton are older than in any of the southern cities. Their wiring is attached conspicuously to the sides of the stone, drilled into brick like a thousand creeping black vines, lifelines in and out of houses, offices, prisons, information blood cleaned up and filtered out before it reaches its destination. Cities are organs and that's never clearer than in Luton. This is the epicenter of the old world or what's left of it. Further north and south from this, things get more modern, newer and sleeker with their veins hidden under sophisticated skin, but nothing has changed here since well before the fence went up. Soon, Luton is left to marinate in its old dust as the train hums north and the temperature drops even further. He checks his pockets again for his ID, not anxious but cautious and relieved as he finds it in the blood warm feeling from resting against his skin. The first time he'd come up to the fence without ID was a few months after it went up and they just turned him around and sent him home. The second time was six months later and he'd been held for ten hours under suspicion of terrorist activities before they put him on a train and back the way he came. He's not forgetting his ID again, who knows how much things have deteriorated in another year on both sides. He feels the fence before he sees it. It's been an hour since they passed through Luton and they've snaked their way through three other cities since. His eyes are starting to droop in the darkness outside the train and it's still not even quite noon yet. The huge freighter trucks that sputter on the road beside their tracks are queued back for two cities now. There must be a problem at the border. He hopes it's just the road because he needs to get to work on time. He already missed two days for the funeral and he doesn't have any compassionate leave left until next year. The hairs on his arms stand up first. Then a few miles later comes the tug in his muscles. 
the electric twitch that tells them they're getting close, the air crackles as they run over a river and through the fog, he can just about look down, see the biggest bubbles from where it boils from the unnatural energy saturating the atmosphere. The carriage seems to collectively grumble as they pack away any electrical equipment, phones, tablets, hearing aids, and stow them in the protective boxes above their seats. The speakers crackle into life and announcements come over the crappy old technology, telling them to do everything that they already did. Protective gear can be obtained from the guards for the following individuals. Children under one year of age, sufferers of epilepsy, passengers who have medical monitoring equipment, bio-attached. He doesn't listen as the familiar list carries on. He's too busy checking his pockets for anything electronic he might have forgotten. He's lost three phones and a watch through the fence already and he's not fucking losing anything else. The lights switch off with a winding down buzz like a turning off of an old TV and the silence that follows feels full and thick. There's nothing hollow here, even as the most experienced eyes on the train turn to the windows, craning out to get a look at the thing, the fence. Soot black and gunmetal grey and the purple sparks that will boil your blood into vapour in seconds, crawling all the spikes like nerves, shooting to the top and fizzing into nothing like poison champagne bubbles. They pass through the fence in silence. He sees more graffiti on the walls of the detainment buildings that surround the tracks. Live free or fry dying.